Hello, space people. Welcome back to the podcast. I am in the studio here today in our little sweet corner of the universe. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping you're well, man. I hope you're hanging in there. I know things have been crazy. My life literally is completely different than when it started. <laughs> So um, we are, I I hope you're hanging in there. Believe me, I think we've all gone through a certain point where reality just seems like it's not there anymore. Like everything that used to be is no longer, that we live in this completely new world with new rules. And I'm with you. I feel you. But one of the things that I want to share, something that I've, I've been really trying to focus on, and it's, I've gotten to a point where now I can share this with you guys, where it's it's really using and, and trying to stick to a scientific mindset to traverse the mind f- that is today's chaos and 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 just be able to lightly skip across the surface of insanity um, so that we can try and make sense of everything that's going on because in the world before COVID-19 and before lockdowns and before you don't really travel outside of your house. Uh, going to the post office is such a strange experience. People standing six feet apart, people not knowing what uh, can be done, what can't be done, people taking sides like they did with every other political issue before this and social issue. And now COVID-19 has done, this is, we've done the same thing with that. There is something to be said about just using science in your everyday life to get through this. So I'm going to go through a few different things here uh, on how this relates to how we break down information in today's world. How, what does this mean for like uh, getting a cure and a vaccine? What does this, what does this mean for understanding this virus? What does this mean for uh, applying other scientific ideas to common everyday things and, and to, especially stuff with this COVID-19 stuff, to, hey, there's, it's, it's, there hasn't been enough time for us to get perfect science. But what is good enough, right? What is good enough that gets you to just a certain state where you can be sure enough to move on and, and not be in a state of fear, right? That's really why I'm sharing this advice, because this kind of stuff has helped me get through this. And I'm hoping at least it helps one person at least one person, right? Um, so let's hope, let's make sure this, uh, let's hope this makes sense. <laughs> but what I, where I want to start is I want to start talking about just the basic idea of a science, how a scientific idea progresses in science, how it accrues more value in, uh, and, and, and respect and basis in science. And that's the scientific ladder of, of ideas. The scientific ladder of ideas is something that we talked about in the early days of the podcast when I was really going deep into Einstein. I was thinking back to my old days in college where I was thinking about how, how much was involved in uh, writing a scientific paper and, and structuring it a certain way and just how you think about those things and, and a hypothesis, a theory, and a law in science are the three stages that an idea will go through, right? Hypothesis is an early stage where you're questioning reality and you're almost posing, well, you are posing a testable hypothesis, a testable question to the universe saying, I think under these conditions, this is what's going to happen, and these are the conditions for that test. And then you go about actually testing it out. And it's not until you get a bunch of tests into your repertoire, into your testing, that you can finally start laying a basis to become a theory, right? And that's a big jump in how serious we take things, right? Hypothesis is fun to let your mind wander, but then there's a lot of questions that you have, and so when it when an idea gets past being a theory, and it, uh, past being a hypothesis and into being a theory, that's when there's more weight to, to, for it to be considered, right? And there's many levels of theories, right? One of the, I think, weakest theories, but uh, definitely one of the ideas I love and, and want to see go forward is the, this idea of uh, string theory, right? Where we have these multiple strings of reality that intertwine to make what we see as reality today, and never mind all the other dimensions that we don't see, right? It's what the fabric of everything, right? But how do you test that, right? So, so because it's not testable, right? How I see it is that it's not super far up the scientific ladder. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend a lot of my day really taking it completely seriously. Although it's a super fun topic to think about, right? 
But uh, great theory, right, is the theory of general rel relativity, right, where Einstein was basically trying to give us an equation that gave us an idea of space and time and, and the interactions of that, and it changed how we thought about light and, and just everything. That test with using the solar eclipse to see basically the curvature of space around the moon and the sun, I mean, the, the, the insane way to test it, but he found a way to test it, and by doing that, it opened up us to a whole spectrum of new things that we were able to see, right? And then, after so long, it's been tested in so many different conditions, they've tweaked it, tried to make it fail, and when you do everything right and it still shows you the same thing, this is where you get to become a law, where it becomes very respected, and it becomes a foundation of how we look at reality, right? So, what does that mean <laughs> as far as this breakdown for the information that we see in today's world, right? I think a lot of the information that we see in today's world, if we were going to place it on the scientific ladder of ideas, uh, hypothesis, theory, and law, most of the stuff that we see that, because let's be honest, it's coming up on our phones, right? Most of the stuff that we see on the front page, uh, a scrolling title, a headline, which is what most of us read, uh, a meme, a uh, tweet, all of that stuff is, for the most part, not even a hypothesis, right? Because a lot of these things are either a, a tweak on how someone said something or it's posed in a certain way to give a certain reaction. It doesn't really have much weight scientifically, right, as far as how, how good it is. So you have to then dig a little bit deeper, right, if you're going to really get a, a good answer. And that's when you start getting into the weeds. <laughs> so you really have to, you know, if you go in and someone says something, what's the first thing you do, right, to, to try and verify it? What I will do is go into the link and see, especially if someone's talking about COVID-19 stuff, right? I'll go in and see who they are referencing numbers, right? Because the big thing was talking about numbers. And I've had people close to me that have been sending me stuff and uh, trying to defend, a, you know, a position one way or the other. And you can tell the difference when it's something that's posed to just make you feel a certain way. And then there's other times where there's just no link. There's no source. There's no, it's like, well, where did these numbers come from? And it's very easy to just throw a bunch of numbers up there and for it not to mean anything. So you really have to look for sources and make sure that you, you do the best that you can with that. Now, what does this mean for getting a cure or a vaccine for this virus, right? How I look at it scientifically is having something that's going to be available to the general public for everyone to use is going to take a long time because there's a lot of different factors that are involved, right? Once you find something that works, then you also have to start testing it in a wider group of people, right? Because as similar as we are genetically, there's so much that's diverse about each individual, even the way that we generate from what I've, what I understand, you know, Obviously, if you think I'm wrong, you've got something to add, put it in the comments below, add a source link. But we're all really slightly different, right? The way that medicine works today is it's based off of this average accumulation of what we think an average person is. But that person, that, that thing that we're basing off of is not really a real person, right? But it's our best approximation. And so if we're going to get a vaccine that we're going to freely give to every single person, right, it's going to take a while before they figure out what is safe and if it's not safe, they need to figure out who's, who can be hurt by it, right? Or who, who may be harmed by taking this in prevention of it. So that's a while off, right? So the reason I bring this up is because that, that helps me set my expectations of how I feel about this thing, right? If I know, wow, a vaccine or a cure is, is a really far way off because they're going to need a lot of work to dial it in before it's safe, I'm not going to put much stock into thinking about a cure of vaccine coming quickly. I know it's gonna take a while, so I have to prepare for now and the immediate future. So that's how thinking of something scientifically helps deter and just keep at bay any kind of crazy fears or, or wild expectations of the unknown. Now, what does this scientific mindset mean for understanding the virus, right? Uh, we've been following it from the very beginning here on the podcast. I've been talking about little different things because we've been 
3D printing PPE here and looking into different filter options and, and ways that we can help donate supplies for people on the front lines. We just shipped out eight face shields today to Pennsylvania because people are starting to open up. We've got some, some people who are vision therapists who are, they have to go back into work to help people that need what they need. And, you know, that's going to be the reality for the, for the upcoming futures. How do, you, how do you best protect yourself against something that we still don't really know that much about? What this means for understanding this virus is knowing that we don't know anything about it. And that's the best way that you can set yourself up for, okay, so what's the thing, what are the few things we know? We know that N95 masks are, are the thing that help, but why do they help? The virus itself is super, super tiny. But if I just stopped there, I would think that the N95 filter, it, the, that virus is so small that nothing is going to protect it. So I'm not going to go anywhere. I, I can't breathe, right? That's illogical, right? That's not taking it far enough. With testing and with <laughs> testing, I say that it's in quotes, with everything that's happened, we have seen that from the results, it seems to be it seems to be catching a ride on water molecules, right? So, okay, the virus is really small, but it's only really traveling in mucus and, and water from breathing and, and all that stuff. So we just need to be able to filter out water. And then the next step is, all right, well, if, if everyone needs to clean their hands and wash everything off, then this thing needs to be reusable, right? So then we try and make it so that everything in the mask or the PPE that we're trying to develop here can be reusable. And that's something we're working towards. And it doesn't seem like this is going away anytime soon. So we'll be able to develop this and get it to people and hopefully, you know, be able to at least teach people how to do what we're doing here too. Because we're, we're definitely not out of the woods. So that's how thinking scientifically and, and taking it step by step as to, okay, we can't create the exact perfect PPE. We can't recreate an N95 mask out of nothing. But do we stop there? No, we don't stop there. We use the next best thing and we progress on the logic from there. And because we're learning more every day as this, as this continues, we are going to add that, add to our knowledge from there. Now, how does this scientific way of thinking, taking a thought and then going the next step with it, how does this apply with, let's say, that idea of the water molecule, right? There was some information that came out and it definitely threw people for a curve where we found out that the virus could travel up to 27 feet in the air. And what happened was it twisted and became this thing that people saw that information and jumped to the next step of, well, it just flies in the air. And then there were people literally in hysteria, and I'm sure there are people still today who are in hysteria that it can just try, it just jumps and flies through the air, free willing. That's not, <laughs> that's, that's not how uh, it, it was portrayed. If you looked at the resource material, again, looking at your sources, if you look at the resource they're talking about a test that was done that was showing the you know the spread of you know uh, a sneeze and how far these germs could potentially go because they're traveling in water. So let's track the water. They were saying that under these ideal conditions, you know whatever test room that they decided to do it in, no moving air, uh, a closed space, one sneeze could travel up to 27 feet. I think it was 26 to 28, but let's just say 27 feet, right? So something came up where. Uh, you know, it was like a few people online were talking about it and I was trying to explain, I was trying to explain, okay, this is not this, just because this new information came out doesn't mean we should be seized with fear about this because it's going to take much longer. Are we going to sit around and wait until we get to the next step? Or are we going to try and use some kind of other science, some theory that we, that we know more about that can apply to this? So in this case, with water traveling and through air, I went back to my aerodynamics days, my fluid dynamic classes, right? And having enough, viewing enough flow charts to, to know how different fluids travel, you know, air, a sneeze, you know, traveling through the air, right? It's totally different conditions when you're in a closed room like that and you're outside. Now, obviously, outside, you could potentially get farther. You know, if you're downwind from something, it, let's say, you you know, if you're downwind from something, it could travel even farther than that, right? Uh, the whole thing with running, right? People were running uh, outside, which was great, you got to do that, but they were running outside without masks, six feet apart behind each other, right? 
which means that every time they breathed out, they were walking right through, <laughs> right through the water molecules that could have contained whatever it was, right? So just knowing that, that a, that a cloud of water particles can sit in the air and you could walk through it, that's one thing. The next thing is, you know, if it's super, if it's raining outside, right? If it's raining outside, the it's not going to be able to travel 26 feet. So just knowing a little bit, taking something you already know, again, I'm in this weird position where I can talk about fluid dynamics, right? But there, there are things that we can base our knowledge off of, our, our next step off of. When there's, there isn't any better information available, we can use information that we already know to apply it in the cases that it's acceptable to apply it, right? Obviously, it's a weird thing to talk about because there are definitely people who are um, jumping to conclusions with, inform- with old information, right? There's always that worry. And uh, I definitely have to say, it def- this definitely comes with a caveat that when you do take that risk of using other science to base science on something else, th- there is, you, you have to be comfortable with that if you're gonna, if you're gonna take that risk. But acknowledging the fact that it's not the same thing is a huge step. And honestly, that's where we make a lot of progress in science is using a different theory, a different model. We do this all the time, especially in businesses where they'll take another curve of a different scientific, you know, um, you know, maybe they'll use a sine wave to represent the cyclic loading of uh, a certain metal or you know how often it's going to be taking pressures um there's also plenty of things where people when they don't have anywhere else to go they're they're doing something no one else in the world has ever worked before they'll use a science that you know maybe they're gathering data and it looks like something they've seen before like okay i've seen this represented in this other thing that i learned from before I can now apply that to this and let's see if it works. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. That's not an unscientific thing to do. But when it stops working, you do have to step back and say, okay, maybe I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction with this. Maybe it's not what I thought it was. But these are different ways that we can uh, use what we already know as information to start making guesses for the future of the unknown. And... You know, there's there's a lot to be said about today's world. I think there's it has really pushed us uh, a lot further than I ever thought we would have gotten, as far as just logic. I mean, look, it's no surprise that this recent past that that has been going on in this world, um, the world before this, where politics and divisiveness. I mean, it's nothing new. It's just that this has hit everybody and then we're doing that on top of this you know this this covid-19 thing and this lockdown uh, the unknown the unrest what it's done people have lost jobs um lives completely changed people have lost loved ones and are unable to 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 see them to do the the the, the regular rituals that we do when we lose somebody you know there's so many people who are going to not be able to do that and i what I don't want is you going around without some kind of a tool to base everything that's hitting you all the same time off of. So I'm not sure if that made any sense, but those are just my thoughts this week on on just how we can use science to combat the fear of the unknown. Now, I wish I had better... <laughs> I wish I had uh, uh, more news that things will get qu- better more quickly, that there is definitely a virus or a cure coming, and that it's coming soon, but um, I can't. All we can do is make do with what we have today, right? We talked about this a few episodes ago, um, perfection versus what is good enough, and this is this is the bottom line of what is good enough. Um, so following that, I wanted to, to share that with you today. Next week, we're going to have another episode of People of Science, where we're going to be talking to people. That has been really good. Um, thanks, for everyone, for bearing with me for this episode. Um, but we'll get started with that again next week. And that's it. I hope you're well. Be good. Um, as always, you know, make sure to reach out to us at todayinspacepodcast at gmail.com, uh, todayinspacepod on Twitter, todayinspacepod on Instagram. 
Uh, we're doing daily uh, during during the week. We're gonna do. We've been doing uh, space in a minute, where we're literally taking like this podcast, where we can just shrink it down into one minute to bring a topic to you every day. Um, just been trying to figure out something, some kind of micro content that we can put out daily that does what we're trying to do, and it's a little bit more effective, which is just communicating to you, right? Not everyone has 25 minutes for a podcast episode, but some people have a minute while they're scrolling through their phones. So trying to get some kind of scientific information to you that you might actually scroll by. So check that out at Today in Space Pod on Instagram. Um, also, we're doing this on TikTok, and we're we're on TikTok, we're talking about space science, and we're talking about 3D printing, so you can see what we're 3D printing in our lab there. And yeah, that's it, folks. Man, I, I really I really hope that you're doing well. Be good, stay safe, and you know, if you do have anybody that is a space fan, a Star Trek fan, first of all, right? We have the uh, com badge that we've 3D printed. So this one is one that we're gonna be working on uh, soon here where it's actually going to be cosplay, so you can actually wear your com badge uh, as the Trekkie that you are. Um, but we also have a fridge magnet uh, that can hold up all those crazy invitations, thick, super thick piece <laughs> invitation cardstock paper, so you can have a little bit of space at your refrigerator. Uh, we've got these on our Etsy page at ag3dprinting.etsy.com. You can check that out, support us, and you know, send that to your Trekkie friend. Also, we have our Baby Yodas that we have started getting out. Those are also on our Etsy page. So if you know anybody that is in need of a Baby Yoda, which I mean, look, who, who doesn't need a Baby Yoda at this point? It's definitely, definitely good to see these little guys just popping up around, uh, around our lab. You, know, you just turn around and there's a baby Yoda. It's great. But we are also selling those. Uh, those are at Etsy. So if you want to help support the podcast, spread the word to somebody that is a space lover, Star Trek, Star Wars lover. And that's it, folks. Uh, May 27th is the launch for the Crew Dragon Demo 2 launch where we're going to have Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley, first astronauts from American soil from NASA to launch an American spacecraft. I've been talking about it all week. I'm pumped up. I'm not going to be able to go because uh, this lockdown is just craziness. And the administrator said you they don't want people going. There will be people going, and we'll probably try and get them on on <laughs> on our live uh, broadcast of that on May 27th, 4:32 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So we we will we will we will be watching, uh, and we will see the first launch of Crew Dragon with humans, and it's the first time we're going to be sending people into space from American soil since 2011 the space shuttle. I know I say that so many times, and it just just kind of falls out. It's just, but it's so true. Man, May 27th. Stay tuned. We're going to have more coming up here on Today in Space. Be good, stay well, and we'll see you next time.